March 7, 2011, I packed three bags of uh, clothes. I was originally supposed to go to New York for 90 days, you know, test things out and see how it would work. When I got, got up here, man, I decided to stay. I just ended a four-year relationship, so I had cut all my ties to Atlanta. I felt like I had outgrown the Atlanta market, and I was ready to see whether I could sink or swim in the Big Apple. So I bought a one-way ticket. I sold all of my uh, items that I couldn't bring with me. I hopped on a plane, and I remember as we were approaching the uh, LaGuardia Airport, one of the ladies came over to intercom. She said, welcome to New York. She said, to one side you'll see Rikers Island, and the other side you'll see the Statue of Liberty. And how you act in the city determines which one you get to see. And she said, welcome to New York. And I was like, oh, damn. And this guy next to me on the plane, he starts laughing. I'm like, what's so funny? He said, man, I just got out of prison down south, and I'm headed back home to New York. I'm not going back going back down south. I said, well, I'm from the south, and I'm not going back south either. This is my new home. I've been here two years now, and I don't regret it at all. I got here that night. I didn't even get to sleep. I had an audition that next morning, so I had to unpack and set up my room where I was staying. And uh, it took me three hours to get from LaGuardia over to my friend's house, because I, I got lost on the train. So I had all my luggage. It was during the heart of a rush hour, six o'clock in the afternoon, I'm lost. People bumping me, I'm bumping people. This lady kicked my bag because I bumped her foot with my bag and she cursed at me and I, I guess my new New York instinct kicked in because I cursed back at her. I learned how to adjust real quick. That was my baptism by fire. I'm still here. So the next day I had my audition. It was probably one of the worst auditions I've ever done. But they cast me and I got the part. With no sleep, wrinkled clothes, frayed nerves and everything, I got the part. And I've been here ever since, working. New York's been good to me so far. Between 1998 and 1999, my uncle, my mother, and I, we all uh, battled cancer. My uncle, he was facing, uh, he was terminally ill, and he was dealing with uh, bone cancer. And my mother had uh, a tumor in her kidneys, and they weren't sure if it was benign or malignant. And uh, they suggested that she have her kidney removed so they could uh, do a biopsy. And uh, because once a tumor spreads outside of the kidney, there's nothing to can be done for it. And I had uh, tumors around my neck. I had Hodgkin's lymphoma. I had six tumors and all of them were about the size of a quarter. So they removed my tumors and they started me on an aggressive uh, six months of chemotherapy. And my wife had just given birth to our second child. My mother was dealing with her own uh, recovery. So I didn't want to upset even one of them. I didn't tell anybody about the uh, chemotherapy. My hair was already thin in the top anyway, so nobody knew that my hair was falling out. So that wasn't an issue. And uh, thank God, since that time, my mother and I both have been in remission. Uh, but unfortunately, on Labor Day of uh, 1999, my uncle passed away. I was at his bedside and I was holding his hand. I paid a big price going after what I wanted as far as being an actor and an entertainer. I lost a daughter. I was homeless for a while. But this was my dream. And I wasn't going to be denied no matter what I had to do. I was just determined I was going to make it. So I've been through hell. You know, I've been, I've been I've really been through hell. I've lost everything. 
but when I moved here, I found out a lot about myself. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. I was just so determined. And there was no way I was gonna take no for an answer. I wasn't gonna be denied. I never gave up, man. I just never gave up. And I just kept pushing, I kept pushing, I kept pushing. And my faith in God is what got me through because I didn't do this on my own. God just put the right people in my path and took the wrong people out of my life. All the people that said I was crazy, said I was wasting my time, they're no longer in my life. And now I'm surrounded by people that got the same kind of dreams as I do, you know, just want to make it. I want my story told, you know. I think that my story will, will help some people because there's a lot of people out there, they, they want to do what I'm doing, but they don't have anyone in their corner saying, you can do it, keep pushing, don't give up. Don't listen to these people. Don't listen to that person. Just keep going. And I learned to motivate myself through my strong faith in God. But some people don't have that, but I do. So now I gotta pay it forward and keep pushing and tell other people, you know, keep going, don't give up. There's so many nights, man, I just cried myself to sleep though just frustrated, you know, I, I thought, felt like the world was on my shoulders, but I just kept going, and now it's starting to pay off, but it's been real hard, I mean, it's been real hard, it's been a lot of nights, man, I just wondered, was I wasting my time, and I felt like packing up and just giving, giving it up, but I'm so glad I didn't. So glad because I would have regretted that for the rest of my life had I given up and gone back home. New York's my home now. And I'm not going back. I made it. I'm an invisible man. No, I'm not a spook like those who haunted that girl. No, I'm not one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Like the bodiless heads you see sometimes in circus side shows. It's as though I've been surrounded by mirrors of hard, distorting glass. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, the figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. I'm about to go in here and do my uh, audition for this part I submitted to uh, through my agent. I'm real positive about uh, playing a bad guy as usual, so I'm looking forward to it, see what happens. And uh, this is gonna be a, uh, on a TV network. This is not a film project. This is for a uh, ongoing TV series, but it's gonna be a pilot episode. And uh, hopefully they'll give me the part and I'll see what happens when I get in there. Um, hopefully they'll let me read for more than one part. When they do that, your chances of getting selected are a lot better versus reading for just one part. And um, about to go ahead now, see if they'll let me uh, get here early. I got here about 30 minutes early, so I'm gonna see what happens. Well, I got the part that I read for, so I just have to wait now for them to call and tell me what the shoot schedule is and where to be and what to do. Now that I'm done with my audition, I'm gonna go down here and get one of my favorite cigars from one of my favorite cigar shops 
here in the city. And uh, I'm going home and get out all these hot clothes and rest. So today is about to end well for me. Nice cigars and some good Hennessy. I just got three hand rolled cigars, one nice fine Cuban. Uh, I'm going home, I'm gonna relax. It doesn't get any better than this. Hand rolled cigars. You can't get it any better. Not in the factory. There's a gentleman back there hand rolling them. Smooth smoke, a real good smoke. And I'm gonna go home and enjoy myself. Throughout my life, I had people always encouraging me to give comedy a try. Uh, my, former, my sister in law, she said, uh, You know, have you ever thought about doing comedy? You're funny. You should give it a shot. I'm like, Nah, you know, cracking jokes is one thing, but being on stage is different. And I kind of brushed it off, and, but it always stayed in the back of my mind. Well, 10 years down the road, um, my life just turned upside down. I was a, a school teacher and I was. Uh, accused by a student for, of assault and I was facing six years in prison. I lost everything. I lost my family, my job, my home. I was in the street. People turned their backs on me. I was facing 60 years. Something I didn't do. And to this day I still have the uh, paper from the Georgia Department of Corrections you know, giving me permission to travel out of the state because I'm so scared that if I ever get stopped, there'll be some computer glitch and I'll end up in prison on a violation. Even though I've satisfied all the conditions the courts put on me, I'm just so afraid of taking that out of my wallet that I still have it. And uh, I moved on and I, I, I met a girl and we developed a great relationship with what I thought at the time and she was pregnant with our child and she was carrying a girl. And uh, I went out with the members of my motorcycle club and I was just standing around cracking jokes. And J. Anthony Brown walked up behind me and he tapped me on the shoulder. He said, well, have you, young man, have you ever done comedy? And I was like, no, sir, I haven't. And he said, well, you should give it a try, you're funny. And he sat me down and talked for about 20 minutes and uh, I was so hyped up that somebody of his stature would think I have talent to be a comedian. I said, well, look, maybe I need to look into an open mic so that the following week, I discovered that there was an open mic competition in Atlanta and I called the local DJ who was the host and he said, yeah, come on out. If you're funny, uh, I'm gonna let you have three minutes. If you're funny, you do seven next time. So. I went out and things did, did pretty good for myself and the three minutes turned into seven. I started developing a following. I kept going back. Um, but that first night, my girlfriend's, one of her friends was in the audience and told my girlfriend what I'd done and she had already threatened me. Uh, she said, that she was gonna uh, get an abortion and put me out if I went ahead with this pipe dream of mine, as she put it. And uh, she did, and I spent the first six months of my comedy career out in the street, 
you know, I was washing up in gas stations and I had nowhere to go. I would spend the days in the library just so I could stay cool or stay dry. And here I am, I'm dying inside emotionally. I'm crying myself to sleep every night because I felt the guilt of the blood of my daughters on my hand. And I'm on stage making people laugh, but I'm, I'm just catching hell. It was just, it was, it was awful. Um, that was the worst experience of my life. The only thing that really discouraged me since I've been here, um, I had a job, I had two jobs actually. I was waiting tables and I was uh, demolishing uh, houses and I didn't have any problem with the home demolition job, but every time I needed to take off from my uh, restaurant job to go to an audition, the first manager I had was very supportive of what I was doing. But the second one, she was a trip. She cared, could care less about my acting career. Um, but the first manager I had, he had done some acting himself, so he understood. And I would always switch out with people. And she came to me one day, she was mad. She was like, you're going to have to decide, do you work for us? Or are you going to chase this dream, this dream of yours? And I, and I looked her in the eye and I said, I didn't move to New York to wait tables. I'm just doing this to uh, have some income coming in in between auditions. She said, well, you got a decision to make. I said, well, my decision was already made. And uh, that was it. That was the end of that. But uh, she got real jealous because when I first moved here, Lottery Ticket, which is a movie I was in, they gave me my first break. Um, it started showing on HBO and a lot of my coworkers saw me. And uh, they were like, man, I saw you on TV last night. Is that really you? I was like, yeah, that's me, that's me. I said, you know, don't tell nobody, you know, kind of keep it on the low, but that ain't doing any good. Next thing I know, people coming in the restaurant, taking pictures with me with the camera phones, and, and next thing I know, my coworkers are taking pictures with me, and next thing I know, their friends are showing up at the job. And so this chick, she really didn't care for that too much, so she was riding me hard whole time I was working there. I don't think I stayed here three months. But like I said, I came to New York to act and make movies. I didn't come to wait tables. So that was the end of that job. And ever since then, I've been doing this whole film thing. Full tilt. Maybe that's God's way of letting me know that's what he has me here for. That's where I look at it. So I uh, got up here and I was by myself. I had a few Facebook friends and uh, one of them stood out more than, than the rest of them. But I never thought she'd pay me any attention, but I kept her as a friend anyway. So uh, I would flirt with her and she wouldn't pay me no attention. I would make little nice comments, still no, no response. And finally uh, I just broke down and said, look, uh, what you doing this weekend? Wanna hang out and get some drinks? And she's like, sure. And uh, been together ever since. <laughs> Can't even throw her away. I'm just playing, I'm just playing, I'm just playing. We've been together for a while now. And uh, it's good to have somebody you can always laugh with, so and Antoinette does that. Yeah, so she, she finally said yes and gave me a chance. So I got her now. She's easy to get along with. Only thing I'm kind of looking at her sideways about, she's a vegetarian. You know, I'm from the South. We eat meat and pork down south. So I don't know about that. I'm gonna have to watch her. Kind of hard to trust a person don't eat no bacon. But a lot of these people up here on that kick, they don't eat bacon. They don't uh, eat fried foods. Basically, they don't eat nothing to taste good. So as you can see, I'm wasting away fast because I'm down about six or seven inches in my waist since I've been with her, so. I don't know, I might be wearing a Speedo by summertime. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy.
They're gonna put us in jail. I can tell them, and we ain't gonna make it till later. Then. <laughs> Before I left Atlanta, someone I really, really respect is by the name of Antoine Fisher. I reached out to him to uh, help me write my film script about my life called Invisible Man. And I got the title from one of my favorite authors, uh, Ralph Ellison. And I never expected him to respond with a personal email to me, but he did. He said, no one can tell your story better than you can. He said, you should write it. So I started out writing it. And um, I registered my story with the Writers Guild. Um, I'm in the works now to shoot a short um, based on the first script I wrote. And uh, that's the best thing I could have ever done. I already was writing my autobiography and uh, I never knew how much legal work was required behind the scenes. I'm glad now I'm working behind the camera and in front of it. Um, I got permission from Ralph Ellison's estate to use a quote from his book in my film and uh, this thing's been so exciting that it's just it's overwhelming seeing your baby start to take on a life of its own when you write. I never thought it would be this much work, but it's a labor of love, you know, writing my life story and putting it out there on the camera for everybody else to see it. And uh, I made it. And all those naysayers that uh, people, even in my family, will tell my parents, oh, he's just some um, Try to use you for money and live off your retirement. He's not going to do anything with it. He's wasting his time. And the next thing you know, I start popping up on TV. Different shows. And then word started traveling about me writing and directing. The next thing you know, I, I worked with uh, Justin McCullough when we shot a documentary. Got that in a few film festivals. We won one of them. And uh, I haven't looked back. The rest is history.